Hello and welcome to Android Developers Backstage. I'm Tor Norby from the Android Studio team. I'm Romain Guy from the Android Toolkit team. I'm Arash Mabad, the general manager of uh, Games on Google Play. And we have a special guest co-host today. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Oh, hey, everybody. I'm very excited to be here. I'm Chad Haas. Uh, I am not on the Toolkit team in Android. Right. So who are you now? Um, I... Uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure that out. I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to answer that very question. Cool. All right. So, Arash, what do you work on? Uh, Google Play. Uh, um, I, I actually just recently switched job out, jobs. I was running uh, the Play Store engineering team for oh, 12 or 13 years, uh, and then uh, recently switched uh, to focus on games. It's one of our largest verticals. May I say that I have a sense of deja vu here? <laughs> For the listeners, we've already recorded this episode and we had uh, technical difficulties, so we were re-recording no, 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 no. it no, again. That's not, how we, <laughs> that's not how we talk about that. We say, this episode was so important that we actually rehearsed it. We don't normally do that, but we so, had a dress rehearsal. All I'm going to say is that ago. last time we recorded this episode, Chet was a, a real host and now he's a guest host. Draw whatever conclusions you want. <laughs> I feel like he didn't want to be in the room with me, so fled the state. <laughs> Yeah, so this is kind of a, a timely topic, given that you know we're we're having the game developer conference and so on. So, uh, what's going on with uh, play games these days? Oh, a lot. Um, I, I think one of the biggest things is that we, we're trying to figure out how we provide value to developers across the entire life cycle. Everything from you know concepting your game all the way through running your game as a live service, and you know everything in between there. Uh, so. We, we've been really focused on understanding and mapping out every part of that life cycle for all of the archetypes of developers and then trying to figure out how we can provide value. So definitely work in progress. So that sounds like you should give us a, a talk called like life of a game on play. You know, from, from coming soon. From yeah. the idea yeah, yeah. to like the release. I would love to see the life cycle diagram. You know, with the on create and on suspend. All <laughs> the way to retirement. That, that's like three <laughs> levels deeper in one of the uh, the sub blocks of that life cycle. You mentioned lots of things that you want to do. So what? what, what maybe some more concrete things about what the pieces are that you're actually providing or you want to provide or we're working on or whatever. Sure. Um, We've we've been investing for many years in tools across each of those like pre pre launch uh, during the launch phase and the post launch to run run your game as a service things like um, in the pre pre launch phase you can think about pre -regist pre registration of games and, and helping build hype uh, for for new games that are coming out um, during the launch phase helping you kind of amplify that moment for you as a developer um, kind of. Uh, promoting uh, significant events that are ongoing and and um, uh, building hype, coordinating with creators across YouTube, uh, working across our ads channels, and then when we get past the launch phase, it's it's quite it's a quite a challenging market for developers nowadays, um, and we're trying to help uh, developers navigate that by providing. Uh, we call it promotional content, but it's basically a, a mechanism for you to kind of time your game's beats with promotional moments in the store. So if you have a, a new um, content pack dropping or a new big update or you know live events that are going on to help you amplify those moments in the store. Um, and then also to, um, to, to help. Uh, so that's kind of for engagement. And on the monetization side, we think about things like our points and pass program and play game services to help you re-engage or increase depth of engagement or monetization uh, with existing gamers you already have. So you you mentioned that it's an increasingly difficult, uh, I forget your phrasing, but it's really tough for game developers right now. What, what do you mean specifically? Just that there are increasing numbers of apps and games on the store to wade through to get to your specific content? Yeah. Um, you know, Many years ago, when we all joined, or you know, around that time, there weren't that many apps in the store, and the new and updated four. exactly, and the new and updated yeah, section of the, the place, or I guess the Android market at the time, was uh, kind of inundated with content. And you know, fast forward to today, there are millions of of apps and games on the store, and you know, there's a fixed amount of real estate you have to get discovered in that surface. So, the question is. Uh, one, how do you really target that from our side on the organic side, uh, thinking about promoting uh, you know, new and interesting content for our users, but then also on the developer side, what are the tools uh, that, that you have to reach users beyond that, whether it's UA or YouTube and partnership with creators or uh, just hype building? And then also, how do we, um, how do we help you 
uh, kind of navigate the complexity that is the UA ecosystem, meaning like the ads ecosystem in the broader um, broader mobile space, because it, it's it's very challenging to find the right users out of the billions that we have uh, that really uh, are excited about your title or, or that genre or you know the content. So how much is this, you know, the, the game developer trying to find users and how much is the Play Store trying to match what users want based on past preference? Like, can you can you tell based on my usage, like things I've downloaded and maybe the kind of content I've engaged with what I might like? Yeah, uh, generally speaking, uh, we, we do look at, you know, past install history and things like that. Uh, the, the challenge there is you can you can end up in a loop where the user go only explores one genre that they already know. And so we were all, always trying to like, especially with new games, if you kind of rewind a few years, uh, kind of uh, Battleground or, uh, you know, uh, games like PUBG didn't exist as a genre. And, and you know, in the same period of time, Fall Guys, uh, Stumble Guys, things like that didn't exist as well. And so uh, there's always this balance between, you know, helping you engage with the best content in the genres you already know versus like expanding that aperture a little bit and helping you discover. I, w I wish there was a way for me as a user to sort of set up my interest graph. Good news. Oh. Uh, we are actively, uh, humorously for the viewers, <laughs> we talked about this last time as a feature request that Tor had, and we actually have now built that thing. And awesome. we're, we're launching so it works it to when the podcast features. works as uh, yeah. planned. So oh. we should meet more often. You can lodge your feature requests. But yeah, in, in general, I think uh, helping users express inter their interests uh, is is a big piece of that as well. Uh, and and also, you know, how do we help developers see value in, in taking the risk to define new genres? You know, there's a lot of business uncertainty there. So yeah, there's there's the stuff that I don't know that I might like, but there's also stuff I know I don't like. So for example, like I, I, I like YouTube TV, but YouTube TV keeps trying to get me to watch sports. I don't care about sports, but they're constantly pushing me on like this game. And, and I just wish I could say, don't recommend sports. You're kind of like polluting my feed with that. And, and I have the same thing for games. I'm not a first person shooter person. So like when I'm in the PS store, that seems to be very popular. And so there's always those titles. And I wish I could like just get straight to the open world stuff that I like. Well, what's worse is when you have one of those recommendation algorithms, because you know, you may not like sports or you may not like first person shooters, but maybe one time you're interested in watching, I don't know, the Olympics <laughs> or that one game. And then your recommendation algorithms jump on that. They're like, oh, oh, look, he likes something new. Let's <laughs> let's deep dive on that. And so, yeah, it's great to hear that if I can set my interest or say, like, I don't want to see this anymore, that sounds amazing. And I'm assuming you're automatically populating it initially. Like, people don't have to go in and click. Of course. I, yeah, I think it, YouTube Music is the one that, like, asks you to pick, like, here's some music. When what you do you like? Yeah, and, that, and that's a pretty good experience, actually, to say, these are some things I liked. And maybe that for games, too, if I could say, yeah, these are some games that I really enjoyed for you to... But I guess you have enough history. You don't even need that. You're like, uh, we know. But b back to what you were saying earlier about helping, you know, the developers post post launch. Uh, you know, the, the problem you're describing with there are so many games on, on on the Play Store. I think it's not specific to the, to the Play Store. I forget the exact numbers on Steam, but it's something like fifteen thousand games came out come out every year on Steam. So even if you wanted to play them all, there's no way you can. Um, and so. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like there's a lot of incentives for developers because it may be so hard to capture an audience to create a game that's long lived. Because once you have your user, your you know, gamers, you want to keep them with you, so you don't have to do it all over again for the next game. Is that the intention? Like so that? Yeah, I mean that that's actually a general trend in, in the industry of thinking about you know these forever games that last for you know decades uh, and and thinking about live content management and so on. I, I think the the interesting side um, kind of observation there is it also if you think about funding the game right you're going to invest some amount of money in building said game and take a huge risk and taking a huge risk and so there's also this incrementality problem or mm -hmm. mindset problem where over time if you just look over the arc of history of game development we enter enter these waves of more and more incremental uh, adjustment on existing game mechanics and models rather than someone taking a huge risk and and trying something new um so, Come so on, th those, people those are the love it when you change everything uh <laughs> yeah I'm sure you're all familiar. Well, yeah. especially with controllers, it's kind of nice when you're you're continuing the next part of the same title. You already know how to use. You don't have to like. What was? What, what There's was nothing worse than again? when a game comes out and they decided to put a jump button on something really weird, and you're like, <laughs> why? <Yes. laughs> why do you have to be different? For sure. Yeah, and it's it's really interesting. Like you look at the console and PC space; they've been around for a lot longer than the mobile space, and and you know, 
their established play patterns there. And I think it's interesting that those haven't translated as much to mobile. So we're still kind of in this nascent phase where... It is very different. Yeah. Like, what, what do you think is the biggest difference between, like, a mobile gaming experience and, and you know, console gaming? I mean, there's a, a variety of them. I think the most obvious one is uh, the input mechanism is, is far less precise or, or you know, it's, it requires significant thought to design for that form factor. Um, the, the screen size, obviously... But then also, you know, the the subtleties around how how many minutes you have to play, you know, just what engages a user in the mobile experience and the generally more snackable moments versus if you think of like a console or PC, you're looking at like the, the user has walked physically to some device and is going to be sitting there for a much longer period of time. And it goes in both ways where taking a mobile game and just putting it on PC without thinking about it as much, there's there's some optimization you'd want to do. And then the opposite is true as well. A good example of what you're mentioning is that th that mistake I've seen done not only just on mobile, but any kind of portable console is sometimes, you know, you start a game and there's so many splash screens that you cannot skip. And if I'm playing on a portable device, chances are it's because I have a few minutes to play. And so don't waste my time. Uh, I have five minutes to play. Don't spend four minutes showing me your splash screens. Um, and and in, in, on mobile, I've seen that a lot with ports from consoles and PCs where they suffer from that. But all the mobile optimized games that were born from the mobile space seem to be more tuned uh, to the needs of their their players. I'm sort of interested by the input problem because it, like, how do you even how do you cross that barrier? I remember earlier attempts with Android TV where. We had controllers that looked like, you know, console controllers, and then you could play the games. But if the games didn't prepare for that, didn't specifically set up their app to handle input from those, um, then how is that going to work? How is that going to scale across the entire community? And also, like, you don't want to just put your game in that niche where it's like, oh, and now you need to buy a specialized controller to play it because actually they just want to play it at the bus stop for five minutes. And so you'd have to have two modes and therefore it's like it's a it's a chicken and egg like developers won't really build for optional control mechanisms um whereas you know the consoles is built in you have to you have to take input from that controller but here you don't and therefore like would we ever get there like have you have you looked into that like are, is there a dynamic of like serious gamers and serious game developers that want to enable that market um few thoughts on it. One, on the developer side, specifically in markets like Japan and Korea, particularly Korea is a really interesting one. Uh, there is this kind of convergence of gameplay across screens. So, you know, it's it's it, concept wise, the developer is thinking the user has a finite amount of minutes in the day. They're going to be sitting at various screens, whether it's a TV or, you know, console or a PC or their phone. How do we make sure that we're available there? And so, uh, th they're thinking about it in that mindset. Now, that requires you to adapt that game and make sure you balance it correctly across all of these screens and form factors. But the user need is there. They want continuity of play. And the developer want is there. I would say that's not expanded to every market yet, but it, it's it's uh, it's kind of the direction that things are going. Now, logistically, um, you know, one of the challenges, as you point out, is there's a critical mass problem where uh, developers have a finite amount of resources, just like all of us. And so they think like, where is the highest ROI that I can get out of my you know, engineering or product capacity or what have you? And they try to find that opportunity. On our side, the way we think about it is, uh, you know, we have many form factors in the Android ecosystem, uh, tablets, uh, foldables, uh, you know, large screen Chromebooks and um, you know, P Windows PCs and so on. So how do we make sure that when you're doing that work, you get leverage value across all of those? So a basic example would be keyboard and mouse optimization largely helps you adapt for all of those form factors with the exception of foldables. Um, and so if we can make it easy for you to adapt to that control you know, pattern, then you at least get like leveraged return. You know, you, you, you can get uh, optimization across all of those screens in one shot. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah most, yeah, mostly. It, it just, it seems like it's kind of an unsolvable dynamic, but then there are like crossover devices. Like I think the switch is really interesting where they have a, a screen that is like not much larger than the premium phones coming out now. And they built in controllers with it and they have this dock. And so they kind of built in the notion of like, you've got controllers, but you've got a almost mobile device. Um, and they're sort of getting closer to what we have to start with, but then 
you know, the controllers obviously have to be optional on a, on a phone platform. But there's also an so. incentive for developer, right? More and more we see those games, to your point, being cross-platform. Uh, and it's been interesting, there, was, there used to be a lot of ports from PC and console to mobile, and now we're seeing the other way around. Um, and so if you want your game, your mobile game, to show up on those consoles and PC, you have to build a controller support any, any, anyway. I also imagine that the use of game engines, things like Unity and Unreal, I mean, it doesn't do everything for you gameplay-wise, but at least... It abstracts away the complexity of the different platform APIs. Um, I'm kind of curious. Like, but I, I, I don't. Sorry, Tori. I'm. I'll, I'll jump in. I, I have a hard time. Like some games that I play on the console. Like I'm thinking, uh, Ghost of Tsushima. Like there are so many things that you can do that it necessitates having a controller. I'm not sure how you take some of those like triple a type gameplay things and put them on a phone where like and then you tap there are yeah. game, you can try like, some of those games have been ported and it's uh i think you and i might be a little old to get used to those touch controls uh but i've definitely seen folks like play successfully uh, and, and I, I would say um one that demographic thing is definitely true i also feel the same way i, I see a lot of the games that some of the the younger audiences are playing and i'm like I'm a traditional PC, you know, FPS gamer. Um, I just don't have the dexterity to play on a mobile. Um, the the interesting thing, though, is that, you know, a lot of the games, it's not that the game is not um, workable in the mobile form factor. It's just that you have to innovate in how you're thinking about control mechanisms, how you think about HUD design. Um, and, and obviously, it's a, it's a, you can't just take a experience that's designed for a TV or, you know, a 30-inch monitor and, and scale it down to fitting on a small you know, screen. So it's really just about consciously thinking of what that experience should be and optimizing it. it it's not to say that every uh, genre of game makes sense in that form factor. Uh, but, you know, a lot of a lot of the challenges that those AAA games, they're so expensive to make that there hasn't been as much exploration about how you would bring them over. And it's not specific to mobile, right? We see that with games that cross from PC to console, where sometimes I've played RPGs where the UI in the font is so small on the TV because at your PC is on your desk and you're going to sit you know, a couple of feet away from it, not 15 feet away yeah, from it. I think like Baldur's Gate 3 is a pretty good example, right? Where this was a game that for PCs, you know, there's all kinds of keyboard shortcuts to control it. And they... A lot of people were skeptical that it could work on a PlayStation with just a little controller, but I think, you know, it's, you know, like I played it that way, it worked well. And, and uh, kind of conceptually, uh, zooming out from like that specific problem chat, I think one of the the things we've always held in, in mind as play is it's important for us to help users discover uh, content for the devices they're already using, but there's also this cold start problem for all of the new devices and form factors we're trying to get off the ground as Android to provide like a more consistent experience uh, for users across every screen they're playing on or, or engaging on. And so it's our job to figure out how to, you know, make that work for developers, make it easy, reduce the cost, um, you know, provide great experiences. I'm, I'm kind of curious, like, do you have <clears throat> stats on what kinds of games people are playing? Like, is it the kind of, you know, AAA titles on mobile? Or at least for me, uh, I used to play Candy Crush while watching TV. So it wasn't like three minutes in line. It would be a couple of hours, but it was also divided attention, you know, and I know that that was a very successful line of games, but I'm not, I'm just not sure where the majority of time is spent on games these days. Is it like puzzle games or is it like, what, what can you share? There's a lot of uh, interesting genres. So I'd say match three is definitely one of the popular genres, but, you know, th thinking about um, games like uh, um, Genshin Impact or uh, Star Rail from MiHoYo, uh, sorry, there there's a variety, and I think the the really interesting thing is the user base is so um, broad and diverse that I'll just po point the analogy at myself as a gamer. So I, I find myself playing dramatically different games on console, uh, PC, and on mobile. On mobile, I'm tech, you know, typically like a puzzler is how I would describe it, or more of a casual gamer. And then on uh, you know PC and console, I'm definitely in the like core demographic of gamers. So I play a lot of like FPSs, cooperative survival games, you know, open world games, things like that. Um, and, and so it's just it's it's much more nuanced. I think if you just look at the top charts, the problem is there's like so many users that you know there's a lot of diversity in the categories or genres. Well, there, um, there's all the games, but it's also like multiplied out by number of users or number of minutes played. And I, I just exactly, don't have a good yeah. sense, you know, and I don't know how much 
I don't know how much we measure and how much we can share, but oh, no, no, it's, I'm kind of curious. It's all public data. I, I think it's just a, it's not, there's not one answer to that question, I guess, is the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, and, and it probably so, varies by region too, very, probably well, by demographic. And, yeah, and it's, it's a very a very varied question. There's not one genre to point at. So if you looked at like the the top of the charts right now, you'll probably see you know Monopoly Go, uh, which uh, is very similar to a game called Coin Master. Um, we we term that as like a social casino game. Um, but you know there there's a lot of uh, you know interesting variety and and kind of uh, adjustments in what is the popular game in the top charts. Um, yeah, what you, what you mentioned about the the regions, right? Uh, recently, I was I was in Tokyo a few months ago, and I remember seeing giant billboards on the street for games like Gaichin Impact or similar games, which you don't see here. Uh, so I imagine there's a very different audience over there for this kind of game compared to this area. Totally, it, it varies very much by region, by user demographics, uh, just you know, in, interest level, and so on. And then also there's a social component to it, which is. You know, some people play games as as a lobby to just hang out with their friends. So if you look at the very younger demographics, you think about like Roblox and you mm -hmm. know Fortnite and things like that. A big feature in those is that it's kind of like a meta game in the sense that you're entering to just hang out, and then incidentally, you're also playing games and and you can explore. Seems like w one of the one of the complicated things with such a huge and diverse ecosystem is the diverse range of devices out there, right? Like I think traditionally that is one of the more difficult things to handle in such a large um, ecosystem as Android has. And gaming, I think, is at the, the crux of that problem where like if you're on a premium device, you want that thing to fly um, and then it ends up on a device that does not have that power or that amount of memory. And, and I guess what are the... What are the difficulties that people are facing or or what are some of the solutions that people are looking at now to address that problem where a lot of your users may be on devices that simply aren't, you know, the, the newest Pixel Pro type class device? That's probably one of the biggest challenges we deal with in, you know, our ecosystem where we reach all of the users or we attempt to kind of democratize the internet. And as a consequence of that, you have a massive spread between like the $25 devices and the $2,000, you know, folds or... or uh, higher. Um, it's. I don't think it's a solved problem. I think we, we're um, doing a few things. One is that uh, you know trying to help point developers at the reference uh, models that they should at least tune for and optimize for to make sure that they're great experiences. A basic example would be like the popular flagships. We should just make sure as an ecosystem those are you know amazing experiences given that the users are shelling out that money. Um, but beyond that, I think there's a lot of work that we do behind the scenes to just you know, try to make it easier and cheaper. And so do the, as, as Roman pointed out, the, the middleware companies as well. You look at, you know, Unity, Unreal, Godot, you know, Cocos, many others, you know, th they're trying to really improve that, uh, that developer experience and make it cheaper and easier to deploy across platforms. Um, uh, you know, we, we've done a bunch to help tune as well. We have the Android Adaptive Performance Framework and a few other things that help kind of tune the parameters of your game uh, depending on the device. Um, continuing to invest here, though. Can you describe what that uh, adaptive framework is? What does it do for you as a developer? Um, so, so if if I recall correctly, it helps adjust the uh, texture quality and other parameters based on um, both the the graphics capabilities of the device and the thermals. I, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. It's been a little while since I dug into it, but if I recall, that was like roughly how it worked. And so the idea was to provide maybe not as much peak performance, but more stability in frame pacing right. um, on those uh, those devices. Yeah, because one of the uh, one of the issues on 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 mobile is you mentioned thermal uh, thermal throttling. You may be able to hit a certain level of performance, but you can't sustain it because at some point the device gets too hot uh, and performance tanks. So it's better to aim for a lower level of quality that you can maintain and have a consistent experience. And I think yeah, we have solutions to help you with that. I assume one solution could be that it just turns every performance needing game into tic-tac-toe. Just, <laughs> just play in your freezer. That's the answer. I mean, the, the other thing that you know we've been you all are aware of, we've been pushing on for many years is Vulkan adoption as well. So you know, if I recall, we're now at a point where most of the major game engines are using Vulkan backends, and so that provides a lot of uh, Im like offloading CPU workload, and so it's, it it helps with the thermals, it helps with uh, fr frame pacing and frame stability. 
And so there are things like that as well that we're looking at. Uh, Vulkan not only do, can be lighter weight in terms of CPU usage at the graphics level, uh, but the level of control it gives you over the GPU is interesting because it lets you build a frame in a different way than you could before. And so you may have either cheaper algorithms or you can do more with the same amount of power. Like it's just more versatile. Uh, also, OpenGL hasn't been updated in many years now. Uh, so all the new features are coming to Vulkan. You know, Chet's comment about tic-tac-toe made, uh, reminded me, I watched the movie War Games again last weekend. That movie really holds up. So if anyone in the audience hasn't Surprisingly seen- Surprisingly well. War yeah. Games. The uh, games though, not so much. <laughs> well, that's like, that's the beginning here, right? Of, of, yeah. of the revolution, you know, like There's playing- There's beauty and simplicity. Yeah, <laughs> To <exactly>. a point. <laughs> yeah, the opening scene is basically the main character playing in an arcade, right? You know, but, um, but yeah, no, that's a, this is the movie corner part of the podcast. Go watch War Games. I miss arcades. I love the, the hacking with the modem as well, where he's just like calling random numbers until he hits one. Well, war, war dialing. And what's nice about side. that movie is, it, you know, of course, there's some plot holes, but it's much closer. I mean, we have all these stories like, you know, Jurassic Park is probably the most famous for, for being completely wrong about the you know, how they're representing hacking. But this movie is actually, you know, it, it holds up surprisingly. So, tic-tac-toe, you so know, that, that that's our be, movie recommendation we of the week. bring it back. <laughs> um, what else do we provide uh, our developers to like for instance so you mentioned we have so many devices in the field uh, do we offer something in the play console that lets you see the performance of your game across all those devices do we what how do we help developers there like how do we help them target optimizations yeah so we do provide vitals uh, in play around uh a couple of things. We show aggregate metrics for crashes, ANRs, things so like that. So that's what app developers are also. It's not specific yeah, to games. Not right? specific to games. Uh, also for app developers, we're we're trying to. I can't remember if we launched it yet, but we were trying to add game specific metrics there as well, and then also kind of zooming in from that macro level to say like, here are the specific devices that you're having, you know, an outsized problem on, uh, whether it's crashes, ANRs, etc., and to try to help you diagnose that to just get into the details, main, mainly like distilling all of that noise to say, here are the five things you should focus on at this moment uh, to to improve your both both the quality of the experience, but also like your rating in the store revenue. from your users <laughs> and hopefully your revenue, you know. Uh, and at, at the end of the day, that's the thing the developer cares about is the the impact to their business. So um, uh, different kind of question. I, I've always been curious over the years. So I, I know game developers like doing a, you know, AAA title, you got all the graphics goodies in there. Obviously you're in you know, native code or more probably you're just using a game engine and then whatever platform they're built on, but you're not using the traditional um, SDK that we provide for Android. You're not in Java and Kotlin, but a certain large number of the games I assume are like casual games where you can. I, I wondered, like, do you know or can you share? Like, what what is the breakdown in terms of what developers actually use of the tools that we provide for apps that end up in you know the game bucket on the Play Store. You mean of our tools or what tools that they use? Generally? Yeah. Um, well, w w just what tools they're using in general. Like a lot of them are using you know Unity or, or you know other game engines out there. But I know like I've I've looked in Hierarchy Viewer and Debug Tools, and some of the casual games are just using you know the Java APIs that we have because they don't need the you know, FPS performance. Yeah, but by volume, I would say it's Unity. And then if I recall, it's custom engines followed by Unreal mm -hmm. and then everyone else. And um, I'm actually not aware of any casual, I can't remember off the top of my head, any, any meaningful, like significantly large casual games that are using uh, our APIs directly. So most of them are really? doing, uh, okay. I'd say the vast majority are using Unity. Well, it goes back to the cross-platform yeah. thing, right? If you want to be super successful yeah. across platforms, you're not going to use directly our canvas. Yeah, because you'd have to rewrite it right. uh, on iOS as an example. So, okay. uh, but and right. then you know, thinking about taking that game and making it portable across PC and console and other other areas, there's a cost to that too. So, um, yeah. Okay, I was thinking like you know, I just remember sort of bubble-based word games back in the day, but this is like you know, ten years or more. Yeah, I think that was in the um, early days of Android. We saw, I mean, before there was widespread support in the the major game engines. Uh, yeah, folks who would want to make a small game would would you know do custom code, um, and often, I, and I've seen games built with views, right? Where like I've seen yeah. match three games where every sprite on screen is a view, and my reaction was. I was proud that our view system could handle that because <laughs> it was not designed for that. 
I think I made one of those many years ago <laughs> before I joined. You probably made me cry then. I remember someone asking me about particle system stuff at an IO many, many years ago um, and having a hard time because like all of a sudden they got 300 objects on the screen and things are starting to call, crawl. And it was like, yeah, it's not really the, the thing you're trying to do is not really what that UI. Yeah, because yeah, I've seen people where each particle for. is a view. It's like, please don't do that. <laughs> mm. uh, actually, yeah. I actually kind of want to write a particle system for Compose, maybe, maybe it's in 20 years when I have time. Uh, so what else do we do that's that's useful or interesting or that our developers should know about if they're working on games? I mean, I think the biggest one is uh, not necessarily in, in making it cheaper to write the mm -hmm. game, but reducing the cost at the at the back end of it, having to make that drumbeat of content on a like there's a content treadmill at the end of it to, to your point uh, to make these games that are that have staying power. And it's really, really expensive to, to do that. And I, I don't mean just like, you know, money wise, I just mean focus, like it, it planning out a content schedule over many months, having a drumbeat of launches, d doing the, the technical and product work and, and design work to uh, get those things out is very complicated. And we both want to help reduce that cost. But then also inevitably, when you launch that thing, we want to continue to invest there a lot to help you reach the right audience and engage them and, and keep your uh, excited users continually excited and not churning. So that's that's been a big focus of ours uh, because, you know, frankly, I think we, we've done less there than than there's a lot of opportunities is, is the way I would put it. Um, and the, if you look at our, our kind of products, we have uh, I, I mentioned pro promotional content already. That's kind of like our, our ability to promote offers and events and updates and so on. But we look at uh, things like our Play Pass um, subscription offering or uh, our Play Points uh, uh, loyalty program uh, as, as big levers that developers can use to reach a super motivated uh, base of paying buyers. Um, so for, for Play Pass, the way we think about it is it's a set of users who have already opted into getting a subscription on the platform. They just want to get interesting content. So, so far we've been offering you know paid apps and games. Uh, we've expanded recently into doing you know big offers within you know IAP based games as well on a monthly basis uh, and then uh, for play points it's you know uh, you, you basically like earn money as a consumer uh, or, or earn points as a as a consequence of spending or engaging um, and then you can use those to get special items or discounts or uh, you know cool swag uh, so you know we're looking for those opportunities to help you really as a developer reach the right audience in an organic way without needing to necessarily go and buy ads. How does that work? Does it does a game developer sort of volunteer to be part of this and then they take some then you take some cut or whatever? Is that so so the way it works for points is that you you'll um you'll basically say, hey, I want to sign up. You, there's a like an application process. Once you do that, you can publish your own deals and offers and they're automatically targeted to uh, engaged um, members of, of the higher tiers of, of the points program. There's obviously an editorial layer on top of that as well, but that enables you to at scale reach like our highest monetizing user base. Um, and, and on the, the Play Pass program, we're, we're just, I believe, at GDC, um, actually, Google Games Developer Summit, which is as of filming today, uh, you know, enabling uh, developers to sign up for that as well. And experiment with providing those offers. So an example would be like, uh, if you look at Supercell, they were offering a gold pass uh, discount for, for Clash of Clans users um, as a consequence of being inside of Play Pass. So things like that. We're still in experimentation on, on, on those. Yeah, that, that's interesting because it's true on most of the stores where they get games, there's a huge emphasis on new games as opposed to new content in games. And you know, I'm the kind of gamer where I, I don't buy a lot of, you know, I don't play game as a service. I don't play online. I do like the offline solo experiences. So that suits me. But yeah, you, you make a good point. Like for a lot of players, like what they want to hear about is what's new inside the, the game they're already playing. And I assume like, you know, that's something developers do inside that game. But Well, you see that with airlines too, right? Loyalty programs work because mm -hmm. people like once you feel like, oh, I'm kind of bought in now. You're you're getting more value. And so it's it's kind of virtuous Yeah, I for remember both. Chad forcing me to buy an airplane ticket for a company that did not want to fly because he <laughs> wanted his miles. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> So wh where does this content then surface? So the, your example, Arash, of you know this company opting into this thing, is that going to show up on like the, the homepage of the Play Store or within playing other games? 
Good question. Um, it, it does show up in the homepage of the Play Store. We have a loyalty section of the store as well. And then uh, additionally, one of the things we launched uh, today is what we're calling Game Hubs. It's just the notion that you know, a huge amount of your time as a gamer is spent in engaging with or playing the games you already have. And so we're organizing that content, developer videos, uh, Q and A's, uh, community uh, information, deals and offers, et cetera, and showing those both on, on your details page in the store, like your product page in the store, but across all of the surfaces we have, searching and uh, home pages as well. And then I, I'm curious for any real company, how you navigate the treacherous waters of how much do you promote because it's sponsored content and, and developers you know, got into this sort of pay for play, I'd like people to know about this versus organic, like the developers just finding the people that didn't pay that stuff. There's a particular online purchase store I'm thinking of where when I do a specific search, I'm apt to see 90% sponsored content in all of the top slots. And I just have to keep scrolling down to get to the the things that I was actually looking for. And so it's a like you want to avoid that sort of level of frustration and yet you still want to promote the content that like has a reason that they're trying to promote it. So where do you how do you how do you figure that out? You mean as play? Or yeah. as a developer? Yeah. Uh, on the play side, so uh we definitely think about that a lot, like constantly making sure that we strike the right balance of ad load or just uh, per perceived sponsored content. And, you know, it's been a big focus of ours. I guess a, a big challenge is when, when we talk to, you know, the developer community, they say, hey, can you just feature us and put us at the top of the store? And we say, yes. However, you know, the, the challenge there is that, you know, there are 3 billion users, as, as I mentioned, or, you know, many billions of users out there. Um, how do we make sure that we're showing the right relevant content to that user? So, so for me, as an example, like I just don't play FPSs on my my phone. I play a lot of puzzle games. So showing me FPS content just at the top of the store will feel like an ad, even if it's not actually an ad. So um, it's all from from our perspective about striking the right balance of personalization and making sure that wherever you are in the storefront, that unless you're explicitly looking for something that is out of the norm, like significantly left field from you, that you feel that the content is relevant within reason. Like we want to expand that aperture as we mentioned before. But that, that's kind of conceptually how we think about it. And, and that's why you have the interest graph now where you can sort of have more personalization. It, that's one piece of it. The other piece of it is, you know, recognizing that those games that last a decade, they change dramatically over that decade. Uh, you know, so it, for, for you as a customer, like you mentioned, I think uh, Candy Crush earlier, like that's a decade plus old game, right? And so where did you leave off in that game and you know what has changed since you've been there all of that's really inf interesting and helpful information not just to help the developer have the right pitch to the customer but for us to provide a relevant experience for you because you might actually be excited about coming back to it if there was some explanation of what that delta was since you last, last left and it's interesting well, and it's not just the games that change but we do too right like all the Absolutely. amount of time you have available yeah. and there are types of games you didn't like before you will like now or you get tired of them so yeah it's difficult but yeah, like, I have a solution hey for we're now transferring your levels from device to device that would be a killer feature <laughs> uh, i have a solution for you tell developers tell all of them that yes we're putting your your game at the top of the page it's just we happen now to have two million games at the top of the page so we have to sort them in a specific order one pixel for everyone <laughs> it's like the uh, the old website yeah. How much are we doing with cloud saves now? Is that is that something that we've been working on? Yeah. So um, for cl we've been focused less on the cloud save aspect of it, more focused on identity for for uh, developers as a service. So helping ensure whether it's our identity systems or the developers that there's an expectation that you have as a customer that wherever you're playing, your progress is saved. And uh, you know, there's a variant where you uninstall something, you reinstall it on the same device at some point in the future, or you can imagine like the more active version, which is I install something on my phone, I switch to my PC, I just want to play that and I want to go back to my phone. Uh, so that's a big focus for us right now is providing continuity of play across all of the screens that are out there and working with developers on whatever solution makes sense for them to, to land that. Yeah, that, that's really nice when this type of stuff works. Yeah, Even like, when it works on a single system, I, it's really nice. Switching phones has become a lot less painful than it used to be. Like we 
on the on the platform team, we'd switch phones a lot for you know very good reasons because we we're testing new devices and whatever. And every time to have to reinstall everything, and then it didn't back up your data. But that's gotten so much better across you know all kinds of apps and data. Yeah, and I think the back and forth thing is really important. I I read books both on you know primarily on a tablet, but every now and then on the phone when I'm on a subway or whatever. And having it always go to the latest page I'm on, even if I'm switching back and forth, is really, really important. Um, and that works well. So if I had the same for games, that'd be well, great. At least if, you know, in a book, if it lost your page, you can fairly easily go back to where you were. If a game lost your save, you know, <laughs> that's a bit more difficult. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and from a developer's pr perspective, like it manifests in weird ways. Like, so we had a discussion with a developer recently where they were saying, hey, like I'm buying, you know, ads or whatever or traffic and, uh, you know, why is the conversion rate of my users lower than I expect? And we're like, well, when we started looking at this, it turns out that those users were actually your old users that you're reaching again. And they they downloaded your, they were excited, they downloaded your game. And then it turned out you didn't save their progress. So they were like <laughs> irked by the fact that they had to go and restart from the beginning. So, you know, it, it's, it's a real user pain point. Uh, and I, it's one of those things where when it works, it is magical in the sense that you don't even observe that it's worked. There's an expectation that this type of thing just works, but when it doesn't work, it's very noticeable. Yeah, we're not <clears throat> we're not where we need to be yet. Yeah, right. Like there's still a lot of apps that don't transfer data because developers have to participate. So that would be a small call to action for all the developer listeners. Right? Is please, 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 go write a backup descriptor. And are we doing or, or, or planning, if you can talk about it, on doing anything that's not? not cloud saves, but like more cross game preferences. A good example is like, you know, some people like to always invert the camera control, or I always want to play in performance mode because I want 60 FPS and I don't care about the, the quality. Like, it would kind of be nice if there was a central place where I could set that and then whatever game I launch, like it just reads that information. That is our feature request for this podcast. Yes. I look forward oh, well, to I want to append to it. I, I, <laughs> I want to, you know, be able to set like, you know, large fonts. For example, right? That makes total yeah. sense. Music move, volume move the phone half. Was that move the phone closer? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I'm, th I'm thinking that, like there's a there's a sense of like game settings. Like these are the things that could apply globally across that kind of application, as opposed to phone settings. Like yeah, you can set the font size for the phone. Well, we we did this with like the closed captioning settings, which was nice, right? So at the OS level, I can say yep. this is my font preference, my font size, and and all the yeah. font color and so on, and then all the apps using closed captioning gets it, and well, it feels like this should be like part of your game hub. Well, is that what games, you called it? Yeah. Games I should could look at that at, at that data, right, from yeah. the system, and use that to for the subtitle. Yeah. Right. Here's a feature request for all game developers out there for Tor. <laughs> Please honor the caption settings. Yes. Um, so I, I don't know if we've reached the end of games, but I did want to make sure to, for some reason, I care about um, history. Um, I was I was curious, Arash, if you wanted to talk any about what we've known you most for <laughs> over the years, which is actually um, doing uh, directing engineering on the play side. I think, did you follow on from Ficus, who did, we talked yeah, to yeah. years ago on this? Okay. Um, and you saw the Play Store grow from, while you were there, was it market when you started yeah. there? Yeah, it was, uh, it was oh. my job to rewrite the market. That's why I was hired in the in 2011, I think. So rewriting it into, into what it is now, the Play Store. Interesting. So the, the original, the the, what was the the package name was vending exactly the original yeah, yeah. vending machine well, it's still it's still, um, still, still, still is vending name. actually it's it's very difficult to change <laughs> yeah it has to keep turns out yeah package names are hard to change yeah because like if you change your package name then you invalidate your cert and then you're not allowed on the play store anymore which would be bad for the play store exactly yeah well okay. so your uh, icons disappear in launcher or stuff like that um and you also you were also there uh, for the compose rewrite that's right yeah so that, lots, that was your job, re re rewriting the Play Store? I mean, sadly, I've, I've gotten out of, at least from a work perspective, you know, getting my hands dirty with, with writing stuff. So I, I tend to just set my hackathons nowadays uh, for like 48-hour write a game or something like that, just get my hands dirty. But uh, I can remember many partnerships over the years, like um, View Pager was another one, Recycler yes. View, uh, you know, n now uh, Compose. And I, I'm super excited for us to get back to this world where we're like on the bleeding edge of Android tool, external tools uh, for Play Store, just helping eat our dog food before it gets to uh, developers. Yeah, and for listeners, like the Play Store or the Android market was always an app that, you know, the toolkit team was close to because it is a complex app with very complex needs. It's a very dynamic app. Uh, 
you know, because it, it doesn't show just app and games, it shows a lot of other stuff. Uh, so it was always a, I would call it a stress test <laughs> for... We're just trying to keep your hair getting grayer. Yeah. Plus, plus yeah. you want to keep the minus decay, like you want to be everywhere, right? You can't just be like, well, let's just bump minus decay to 30 because we want to use this new API. Like that probably would cost... Yeah, well, it's not even a cost thing. Like the, the way we think about that is that the users who are on those devices, those older devices, probably are not choosing to, like in the sense that they yeah. can't afford to get a better device. So it's almost like an obligation yeah. to the ecosystem. Yeah. So yeah, anyway, so thanks for all the work on Play Store. <laughs> uh, it's not a simple app. <laughs> I, I, I miss it, but you know, there's some things I don't miss. The Holding the pager was not fun. I am sure. Yeah. So now you're basically like, well, I guess I have to put in a few hours of playing video games. Exactly. It's my job. It's market It's my research. job. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I have to make sure that the, the, the <laughs> games on Play Store are, you know, the quality is high. Exactly. So. And, it, you know, humorously, my, my wife does more market research in that front than I do. So. <laughs> yeah, well, well, it's good to get that feedback. I also get feature requests. But well, now know. we know who to talk to if uh, there's something wrong with the game we play. <laughs> yeah. All right, I think I think that's it. So, um, as always, if you have any questions about this episode, please go ahead and post them on our YouTube channel. That's yeah, leave the... in the comment below. Uh, comment <laughs> below. Right? I did not we... say the phrase "like and subscribe." <laughs> right? No. So, I mean, I, I mean, I personally, you know, tend Click to. The bell. I consume podcasts, you know, as audio, but it's uh, a lot of people are watching the the, the YouTube channel. I so don't that's know if a good place to put Watching us, they might just be listening to us. You know, tap. Yeah, it's not which is okay. Yeah, that, which that's is fine. totally totally fine. So yeah, if you have any comments or feedback, please put it there. Feature requests. Maybe yeah. we Feature should requests. start doing silly things on camera to see if anybody notices. <laughs> well, you <laughs> should do that it. without announcing it just to see. Yeah. Crap. Yeah, exactly. We'll hold up a sign that is not part of the audio feed. All right. Well, thank you for doing this episode it's again. Good seeing you all. <laughs> I hope we didn't forget anything from last time. I don't I, I don't. I honestly remember. don't remember the last time. Yeah, I don't remember yeah. either. <laughs> Thanks. And thanks for uh, to our special uh, guest host for joining us. Uh, you know, it was nice to have you thanks uh, for having one last me. time. It's it's so exciting to be on your show. I've heard of this for many, many years so far. So it's uh, I it's it really used to be better, but it has changed recently. Yeah.